next slide. I'm Leslie Hughes. I'll be moderating this uh, webinar. I've been in the photo industry now for, I almost don't want to say 25 years. Um, my experience bridges creativity, technology, and content. I'm currently the founder and CEO of iSpy Visuals, which is a search aggregation site and workspace for creative pros looking for content. I've been involved in several startups, including iSpy and a thousand museums. I know many of you from my days as president of Corbis Images or as head of worldwide sales at the Image Bank way, way back. Next slide. Nancy Wolf is well known to most of us as the expert on copyright for the photo industry. Uh, as a member of the intellectual property, media, and entertainment law firm of Cowan Debates Abrahams and Shepherd, uh, who is our sponsor today and which is located in New York City and Beverly Hills, she's a partner. Nancy represents a wide range of creative individuals and companies in all areas of digital media licensing and publishing and serves as counsel to DMLA. Nancy's a frequent speaker on copyright, digital media and licensing and will also be a part of our annual conference in Los Angeles this fall. We hope everyone will plan to attend and register soon. Uh, Nancy's the president of the Copyright Society of the USA and serves on the ABA Copyright Reform Task Force. Nancy was selected for inclusion in Chambers USA IP trademark and copyright for New York. She's also been named as one of the super lawyers for intellectual property, uh, one of the top 50 female lawyers, and one of the top 100 lawyers for the New York area. Please hold your questions. We'll write them in the chat box. At the, you can scroll to the bottom of your screen. The chat box should show, and we'll address at four different points throughout the presentation. So welcome, Nancy. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Leslie. And I have to amend one comment, which is that as of June, I'm now the immediate past president of the Copyright Society. It was a two-year term, so now I can devote all my attention to DMLA. But um, anyway, I'm thrilled to be back to do an update on the copyright webinar I did some years ago. Um, copyright law hasn't dramatically changed that much, uh, perhaps just the ease and the way people use content may be perceived differently. But when I went back to look at sort of the myth that my last presentation was to dispel, I found that the perception was really quite similar. And so uh, what this speedy one hour update on copyright law will do is help answer questions like, if you find something on the internet, is it in the public domain? If there's no copyright notice, can I use it without permission? If I don't profit from the use, do I need permission? If I remove content after notice, then you know, do I owe anyone any money? Uh, and how much can I alter a work? Is it mine? And if I don't, uh, if I use a little small piece, do I need permission? So we'll start from the very beginning. And uh, just a little note that um, there really is no such thing as international copyright. What is new about sort of the 21st century is that a work displayed, uh, particularly online, can, for all practical purposes, be viewed by anyone in the world. Uh, but there really is nothing called international copyright law. There are just uh, international treaties that countries sign on to and they uh, agree that each country's law will have particular minimum standards and that they will protect the works of citizens of other countries that have infringements within their borders. Uh, so this presentation is really about US copyright law and it focuses primarily on visual content still in motion, but the principles can apply to almost any kinds of work that are covered by copyright. And in the US, the uh, Copyright Act in place really comes directly from the Constitution, where the Constitution gave Congress the power to enact laws that promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for a limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So that's been the basis of US copyright law from the beginning. And it's always been a balancing of the economic interest of creators with the public's interest in stimulating 
intellectual <laughs> uh, Our current act is still the Copyright Act of 1976, which is effective in 1978. Uh, it's been amended a number of times. 1989, we joined the Berne Convention Treaty and then again amended in 1998 when we passed the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And I'll explain how uh, these amendments affected uh, copyright law when we get to it. Um, so we'll start from the beginning. What does copyright law cover? It covers a specific list of creative content and does not cover everything, as you'll see. Uh, but in order for copyright to protect a work, it must be one, an original work of authorship. It has to be fixed in a tangible medium. And the list of works included in the statute include what you see here, literary, music, dramatic, pantomime. And again, we'll focus on the, what's highlighted in red, pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works, which is where visual content falls, and motion picture and other audio visual works. And I will also touch upon architectural works because they're often depicted in pictorial and audiovisual works. Uh, so one of the first requirements for protection is originality. And the Supreme Court came up with what works were original when it was asked to determine whether a phone book had sufficient originality. And it's a fairly low threshold. Uh, it just must possess at least some minimal degree of creativity. And this came up in a case involving a photograph of the beautiful blue sky vodka bottle. And the question was whether a second photographer infringed the first photographer's photograph in shooting the sky vodka bottle. And one argument was, well, it's just a bottle. There's no originality, uh, a bottle against a white background. And the court said, uh, no, um, the work could be original um, if it has at least some minimal degree of creativity, but this came uh, the expression of sort of a thin copyright. The fact that uh, a bottle, a photograph of a bottle can be original doesn't mean that someone else cannot take a photograph of the same bottle. It has a very thin copyright. Um, but as we have learned over the last few years where we have seen this picture of uh, the monkey many times, um, the Copyright Office has a compendium that is very useful and it explains a lot about how and why certain works can be registered. But they clearly came out that it must be the product of human authorship. Uh, even though that has been challenged by PETA, the courts have upheld that yes, there needs to be human authorship. Uh, the next requirement is a work has to be fixed. That came up in a case where there was a, an architectural landscape sculpture in Chicago, which consisted of a garden. And this was a case that came up under the Visual Artists' Rights Act, and it never even reached the issue of whether this work qualified because the court found it was not protected by copyright because it was a work of nature and it would be continually changing. So they found that it wasn't sufficiently fixed to be protected. Uh, what often happens as well is that works such as graffiti get questioned as to whether they can be protected by copyright because they may not be, quote, legally fixed and in some instances may actually be vandalism, although there are many communities that have a program where graffiti can be approved and placed on a wall. But this is an example of an artist known as A. Hall Sniffs Glue, which has these sleepy eyes in a district in Miami. And uh, American Eagle Outfitters had an advertising campaign that used this as a background. And the graffiti artist sued uh, under copyright law, asserting that his mural was protected by copyright. And, um, and it is, in fact, uh, a work of visual art. It is fixed and it is original enough. So this would be protected by copyright, even though it may not have been necessarily authorized by the owner of the building. Um, 
And I would say this may not necessarily mean you can never take a photograph and use it or film a photograph where there might be some graffiti in the background. So for example, there are probably some neighborhoods that you could not for editorial purposes authentically uh, photograph unless there was some graffiti in the background, but you would want to try to avoid having a shot that was only the artwork where that was the only thing framed. And there can be some, we could see here, some scribbles that may not rise to the level of originality, and I'll get into it. But copyright does not protect things like short phrases and names and literary and uh, typography. So if you don't have some kind of artistic name that's in some bubble shape, there may be no protection at all. Uh, tattoos, the same argument, whether tattoos can be a work protected by copyright because you don't have a, uh, a formal print on paper or any kind of canvas, but you have the human body. And in this case, the graffiti artist who um, had a famous uh, work on, um, on the Mike Tyson's face brought a claim against Hangover 2 because they sort of copied that graffiti on another actor. And the court, uh, in a case where they tried to dismiss it, said, no, the, the case cannot be dismissed. Um, they didn't stop the film, but they found that there was a likelihood of success on the merits that the artist could have a successful claim, so the parties soon settled thereafter, which is often what happens. No one really wants to have an expensive trial, so if you can't have an action dismissed early, then uh, a case often dismissed will be settled and you won't get a final decision. Um, architectural works is a question I get all the time um, because a work of architecture is one of the listed works that can be protected by copyright. But there is a section of the Copyright Act Section 120 that allows pictorial representations of buildings. So the protection to architectural work really is meant so that someone cannot do a duplicate building of a work that's sufficiently original, that's protected by copyright. But it doesn't prevent owners from making alterations to the building or in, in often even destroying the building. Um, so copyright does not protect, as I said, everything. It excludes ideas, procedures, and processes. That could be a patent, facts, words, titles, and short phrases. They may have trademark protection, but not copyright. Works that are not fixed. Something that's just a mere copy of another work. Works that are in the public domain, and I'll get into that. Useful articles and works by non-humans. Uh, and so here's an example of what once was considered a sculpture, but served as a bike rack. So the Copyright Office would not register it because it was a useful object. The, the mere facts, which would be someone's uh, name and phone number in a phone book. And again, our monkey works created by non-humans. Um, so who owns copyright? Copyright can have sole authorship by uh, one creator or it could be the work of more than one creator, which is a joint authorship. And that really requires the intent of the authors to create a work together. And in some jurisdictions, excuse me, jurisdictions, the author must have made an independent copyrightable contribution. And then a work can also be a work for hire, which is very specific under the Copyright Act. It has to be a work within the scope of employment or it has to be a specifically ordered or commissioned work. And there are really only nine examples of that in the Copyright Act. So in many instances, an agreement may call something a work for hire, and it really is a work that should be assigned if the commissioning party wants to own all rights to the work. Um, so what rights does a copyright owner control? Those rights are specifically set out in the Copyright Act as well, and the rights that uh, we'll focus on mostly today, which can be exclusively authorized by the owner, is the right of reproduction, um, the right to prepare derivative works, the right of public distribution, public performance, and public display. 
Um, and the way uh, copyright can be transferred differs if the work is being granted exclusively or non-exclusively. Uh, exclusive rights do require a writing and it has to be signed by the copyright holder or the authorized representative. However, non-exclusive rights, which are often uh, the type of rights that may be granted, do not need a writing signed by the holder or authorized representative. But when you find there is no writing, there is often a dispute about the intent and the type of rights that the user is permitted to use. So always recommend a writing regardless of whether it's required under the Copyright Act or not. And copyright protection uh, under the current act is for the life of the author plus 70 years or 95 years for corporations. So um, I did mention that our, the current Copyright Act has been around since 1978. The act before that was 1909 and it did, had a very different copyright regime. You had copyright for a specific period of time, initially 28 years, and then if you did not renew, uh, copyright terminated at the end of the 28th year. And under renewal, initially it was another 28 years, but there were many amendments. Really the only way to keep track of this is to have a chart. I keep one right on my desktop. Uh, there are circulars published by the Copyright Office that can give you helpful information. And there is a very good chart by uh, a Peter Hurdle from, uh, I forgot what university right now, um, which has um, a lot of this information. But it really is complicated, so I do recommend that particularly for US works, you always check a chart for earlier works. And sometimes you really don't know if a work is protected or, or not still under copyright. Um, copyright may be terminated. Works under this the current act, you can terminate an assignment uh, beginning 35 years from publication or 40 years from signing. And there is a a uh, different section in the copyright for earlier works. Now, this does not apply for works made for hire. So, uh, but this is something that's coming up particularly with a lot of, of uh, music right now, where the artists are terminating earlier contracts. And it's really to give the creator sort of a second chance where they might not have had bargaining power in the very beginning of their career. Um, the question that is, uh, often confused and misunderstood is what is in the public domain. Um, for US work, it's all works out of copyright that were published before 1923. Of course, you have to know if a work was published in the US. Uh, government works and uh, works that fell out of copyright for failure to register or renew under the 1909 Act, uh, which had a lot of of requirements in order to maintain copyright, which included publication with notice. Uh, that was until March of 1989. Now, uh, a lot of foreign works that might have lost copyright because they weren't aware of the requirements, a lot of those have been recaptured. So you really need to know if a work is a US work or not. Um, just examples of common public domain works is a lot of the works that were published by the FSA uh, and one of the most famous works of all, Migrant Mother. Um, and and uh, that's an example of works that were owned by the government. Though the government can license work, so you can't just say, oh, I saw something on a government website. It may be that the work was acquired by license and not created by the US government or a government employee. Um, however, because images may be, quote, public because they're on a website or found in some kind of image search does not mean that the works are in the public domain. And I can't tell you how many lawyers I sit next to in court who get that confused. And I'm finding even recently judges have been getting that confused as well. Um, so uh, I mentioned copyright notice was required until March 1, 1989. Uh, works published without notice would have fallen in the public domain before that. Um, they had to be published with authority. 
Currently, copyright notice is voluntary but recommended, and the proper notice would be copyright notice, year, and name, but you don't lose your copyright if you don't have a notice. And that's one thing that uh, I've even seen in recent cases where a court thought that someone, you know, a work may not be protected by copyright because there was no notice. You know, that would have uh, been under the old Copyright Act and not under the current Copyright Act. Um, the other type of license that sometimes is confused with public domain is a Creative Commons license which is essentially a public license that someone can attach to their work that allows for sharing of work uh, in a very easy manner. However, there's many different types of Creative Commons license. They're not all alike. The one that is most similar to public domain is the CC0, but you have to be careful if you're using any kind of Creative Commons work because some require attribution and there are lawsuits made by those who post pictures uh, with an attribution requirement if works are published without attribution. Um, some works can't be published for anything that's commercial and the Creative Commons, I believe, uh, made a study for about a million dollars to determine what was commercial and non-commercial and it was inconclusive. So you have to use your best judgment. Some do not allow derivative works and some re uh, Creative Commons license require that if you use their work under that type of license that your work also has to uh, carry the same license going forward. Uh, so it's really important that you just don't grab something that says Creative Commons and thinks it's public domain. Um, the other thing you don't get with a Creative Commons license that you might get if you license directly from uh, the creator or the representative is you don't always know that the person who put the creative license actually is the one who owns the work. Um, you don't get any type of reps and warranties or indemnification, that there'll be no claims, but you also don't have any third party clearances. So this is uh, a, a webinar on copyright, but if you want to use a work for a commercial purpose and there's an identifiable person, you will need a model release and a Creative Commons license does not offer any of those releases. And that's something that some um, commercial users have learned the hard way. So it's a good place for some questions and answers if anyone has any. Um, Nancy, uh, as a reminder to the group, you can post your questions in the chat box, which seems to be working. Um, in the meantime, Nancy, I do have one question. Uh, what about photographs of public domain content? Is the photographer able to copyright an image of public domain works, like say NASA uh, space shots that are licensed? Um, if a work is in the public domain, you can't put it back under copyright by just adding your own name on it. If you make a derivative work, which is one of the exclusive rights under copyright, where you add something that's sufficiently original, you could potentially have a copyright just to that portion. But the Copyright Office does not um, accept works where all you've done is sort of enhance and color correct something. Uh, but if you, uh, you know, made some substantive changes that were original enough, you could only protect that portion. But the underlying work that's in the public domain, once it's in the public domain, it's in the public domain. Okay. All right. It looks like we don't have any questions right now, so we can continue. Okay. Now I'm going to get to the tricky part of copyright, Nancy, which I, is... Nancy, I apologize. Right okay. as I said that, two questions came in. Okay. Um, the first is, what year do you reference in the copyright notice, the year it was created, the year first published, the year of, partic of this particular use, the current year? Um, it would be the year that the work was published in the current form, but if you, again, because you can't lose copyright now, if you have a mistake in that, uh, you won't lose it, but it's, it's for uh, the year of publication. But if it's in, for example, if you did a book, which was a collection of many works, that copyright would be the year that, you know, book was published, even if individual works within the book may have been published earlier. So it's uh, typically the year of publication of that particular work that you're viewing. We have a second question. As an agency, can we still charge a fee to license an image in the public domain? 
Um, you can charge a fee because what you are doing is you are granting someone access to your copy. And in that case, you are not giving someone a copyright, but you're getting, giving them permission to use something that you have and that you have provided in a publishable format. Um, and that would be just under contract that you can charge someone for giving them permission to use what you possess. And many historic libraries have works that no one else has collected or have uh, scanned and made searchable. And so you're really giving, um, you're really paying for uh, the usage of that copy, but not a copyright. Okay, that's it. Okay. So, um, so I mentioned copyright gives exclusive rights, but because copyright is supposed to be a balancing of creators' rights and the uh, public's access to information, there are certain exceptions. And I am going to just focus on fair use, but there are different exceptions that deal with libraries and archives, a first sale doctrine, which you know, allows you to buy a work that was published, such as a book used. Um, there's something that deals with face-to-face -face education, uh, secondary transmissions of cable, and reproductions for the blind and disabled. But I am going to, th to stick to the thorny one, which is section 107, fair use, because that is where you get most questions in this area, and it's the area that the courts themselves have said it's the most difficult area of copyright. So section 107 lists examples of works that can be, quote, a fair use where you don't need permission from the copyright owner. And the preamble lists things like criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research. But then it also requires the balancing of four factors, which are done on a case-by-case -case basis. And I will go through each one of these. Uh, and this was based on prior case law. It was just codified in the, the current Copyright Act. Um, and the purpose is this where it would be fair without consent. And I already went through the uh, samples. And those examples are not the only examples of what the courts can consider fair use. Um, it's never an easy yes or no question. Um, there are other copyright regimes in other countries where they have specific exceptions. Um, fair use is typically a very U.S. concept. Countries like Canada and England have something called, um, it's my mind just slipped on it. It's not fair use, it's fair dealing, and it's very fact intensive. So you can give sort of your best advice, but unless a court really looks at a situation, you're not going to get uh, a hard and fast answer. Um, so you can just get guidance and have guidelines. So this portion is intended to try to give you some guidance and guidelines, but it can't answer a very specific question. Um, the Copyright Office has been keeping an index of fair use cases at that link. And so you can uh, check similar cases that may have been filed for that type of guidance. Um, and so the first factor is the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. So fair use tends to favor educational use though it doesn't mean that because something is published in an educational book that you can always use it without permission. It, it's not a sort of de facto, if it's educational, it's okay. If it's commercial, it's not. Um, what has been sort of imposed on the first factor is this concept that the use should be transformative. And that has become the key factor under the first factor of fair use. And it came from an article written, written by Judge Pierre Laval. And it said, transformative uses may include criticizing the quoted work, exposing the character of the original author, pr proving a fact, or summarizing an idea argued in the original in order to defend or rebut it. They also may include parody and innumerable other uses. So this was picked up by the Supreme Court in a case involving the sampling of Pretty Woman, by the rap group Two Live Crew. 
uh, which was a parody case and they asked permission to use uh, part of Pretty Woman and were told no. Um, and so in this case, it was very clear that parody had an obvious transformative value, it has social benefit, and parody is a type of situation where no one is going to want you to make fun of their work. So it sort of fits perfectly into fair use because you're not going to get permission, but there is a social benefit to parody. And from there, it's kind of taken over the first factor and courts have said, you have to look at whether the second use supplants the original or does it add something new? And this has become one of the most significant questions in any fair use case. Um, it doesn't replace all the four, youth, four factors, but it is weighed very heavily. Um, the, the rub is that the definition of a derivative work includes the word to transform. So often it's very difficult to determine whether the exclusive right to grant a derivative license has been infringed or if the second user has created uh, such a transformative use that the work would be considered fair. And because licensing includes the right to create, to license a derivative work, there is often conflict, particularly within works of visual art, as to whether a work should be considered derivative or whether it could be, should be a fair use. Um, and there was an example with the photographer La Chapelle and a music video in which many of the images were sort of recreated in the music video. Uh, and there, um, Rihanna had used eight photographs to create an s and music video. And the judge dismissed the trademark action but allowed the copyright infringement claim to proceed to trial, so the case settled. So again, you don't know what the final outcome would be, but it was too close to be dismissed by the court. Um, the second factor is whether the underlying work is factual or highly creative. It has very little impact on whether um, a use is considered fair or not, so I'm not going to focus on that very much. Um, the third factor is how much did you take in relation to the whole? That's a quantitative question and a qualitative one. For example, did you take the heart of the work? With, with um, photographs as opposed to videos, often courts will allow that the whole work to be taken because you uh, can't make a fair use without using the whole. That's different for videos. And the fourth factor is the effect on the use on the potential market or value of the copyrighted work. And often in this area is what would be the, the effect if, if all many people did this on the licensing value of a work. An example of how courts have shifted in thinking about fair use is with uh, the artist Coons, who had taken a photograph of a couple holding a string of puppies and created a three-dimensional poster, not poster, of, of sculpture. The court ultimately found that this was not a fair use, even though the medium was altered, but was derivative of the photograph. And uh, because the Coons had captured the expression of the couple holding the string of puppies, now, this was before the Supreme Court case that looked at Judge Laval's article. So if you fast forward a number of years, uh, Jeff Koons again has incorporated a photograph as part of a work of art, which is a painting, not a sculpture, and has used it as just one of the elements. And in this case, the court found that the use was transformative. This painting was called Niagara, and Coons came claimed that he was commenting on the ways in which some of our most basic appetites for food, play, and sex are mediated by popular images. So as you can see, the courts are shifting and allowing the, an artist to use elements as part of another work 
to not comment on the work itself, but to make an entire work that's commentary. But here in the Gaylord versus United States case, where there was a photograph in the snow of the Korean War Memorial uh, that was licensed for a stamp, the artist who created the memorial uh, at the end was successful in uh, a decision that said this was derivative and not a fair use, even though the initial court below thought it was a fair use. So this was not considered transformative and that both were used for an aesthetic purpose. Just to show that fair use is never simple, we have the Bill Graham archives versus DK case in which the publisher published a biography of the Grateful Dead and within the text there was a timeline with thumbnail reproductions of concert posters. And the owner of the concert posters brought a claim of copyright infringement and the court found it was transformative because the images were not used for the original purpose, which was the expressive value of the posters, but they were reduced in size and they put the uh, posters in a historical context uh, because they were, were in a timeline with a lot of other text and graphics uh, and that was considered to be fair use. So then we move on to our favorite appropriation artist, Richard Prince, in the famous uh, Carover Prince case, where he copied close to 30 black and white photographs that Carrow had taken of, of um, Rastafarians. And uh, initially, the lower court found that what he had added to the works, which in some cases was just lodges and the guitar, was uh, not transformative, but infringing. But on appeal, the court found that 25 out of the 30 works were transformative. Um, and they used a different test for transformative, which would be whether it didn't matter if the artist had transformed the underlying work for an intended purpose, but how a reasonable observer would perceive the new work to assess the transformative nature. So five of the works the court could not decide on, and the next is more of an example where it is much more collage-like and you don't see much of the original work. Um, those that went back down for the original court to decide whether they were transformative or not, and the case ended up settling. Um, right after that, you had uh, a case called Seltzer versus Green Day, where um, a poster by uh, another sort of you know, outdoor artist um, was used as a backdrop for uh, a music video. And the only thing added to it was the cross on it. And the court found that that was fair use uh, because it was, again, they used the word transformative and it wasn't being used on merchandise. Uh, so there wasn't really any commenting on that work of art, but, you know, based on the Prince case, uh, the you saw this real loosening of what was considered transformative. This may be pulling back a little bit because Prince came up with uh, another exhibit called, uh, I think it was Portraits, where he blew up Instagram photographs um, and just added a hashtag on them. And instead of suing, one of the uh, users decided they would you know, sell the picture for $90 instead of the, I think, 90000 that Prince was selling it for. Uh, but there was an artist, um, Graham, who is currently in a lawsuit because he sold his photograph in the same way that Prince does as fine art in galleries. And um, Prince tried to have the case dismissed right after filing, and the court refused to dismiss it, saying that uh, fair use can rarely dis be dismissed because it's so factually intensive and went through the four factors and really rejected all the arguments that Prince made about it being transformative because both were creative works, both were used for the same aesthetic purpose. And this judge didn't particularly think that adding canal, zinnian, da, da, jam was anything that transformed uh, the work. Um, some quick examples of works that have been considered fair use because they were social commenting. Um, Mattel doesn't like when you use their Barbie. 
for uh, social commentary, it seems, because in one situation, the photographer did an entire series of, of kitchen gadgets doing bad things to Barbie, and the court found that was fair use because there was commentary on the commercialization and the product, and it, the artist's intent was to show insecurities of our beauty and perfection of sex consumer culture, and the other was doing a Dungeness Barbie, and the court just dismissed it right away. An example of parody being fair use is, even if it's a commercial use, was the Vanity Fair cover of Annie Leibovitz, uh, of Demi Moore, and the movie poster for the gun, for the movie, Naked Gun 33 and a third. The court found that this was also a parody. Uh, an example that's not in the visual context, but in audiovisual, that a seven second clip from the Ed Sullivan show introducing the Four Seasons was considered to be fair use and transformative because it, it was used in historical and biographical context, almost like a quote from a book when you're doing a biography. Um, then the area where fair use has a lot of confusion is with the newsworthiness exception, because um, Copyright Act favors news reporting and commentary, but it's not a blanket exception to allow the illustration of an image or a video clip for anything that enhances a news story. So the way I like to draw the distinction is that if the work itself is news, then it, the publication of it can be fair use, but if you're only enhancing a story with an image, that that is generally not fair use. And a case going back to 2000 is a good example of that where uh, Nunez, the, the photographer here, complained because his photograph of Miss Puerto Rico universe was published um, from her modeling portfolio. And it actually the news story was the issue that she actually took the nude photo, which we haven't published here. Um, and there was a controversy actually about the photograph. So the court found that that was transformative because it was used as a news event and not as a portfolio image. But then you have the case of Mon Manja versus Maya magazine, where the plaintiff went to great lengths to keep her marriage a secret until her chauffeur found a memory stick in the back of a car and ended up selling them to a magazine and multiple pictures of the wedding were published by the magazine. And the magazine argued that this was fair use and uh, that argument failed because the court found that there was a market for celebrity wedding photos and that this substantially harmed the sort of the plaintiff's ability to have the first publication and you could have written about the fact that they got married without showing so many of the pictures. And in this case, many photographs were published and the court really looked at that was a way to drive everyone to the publication. Um, then in a case where a photograph from 9-11 was used by Fox News in a uh, social media context at 9-11, was questioned whether that was transformative and fair use or infringing. And uh, it was not dismissed on summary judgment. Um, the court said it could not, as a matter of law, determine that it was a fair use. Uh, the owner of the 9-11 photo had a very active licensing market. And right before the case was supposed to go to trial, it settled. Uh, which is why it's always so hard to give you black and white answers. Uh, but there's a lot of new interesting issues coming up with copyright now as to whether works that are embedded as news um, are going to be protected by copyright law or not. And the trouble is, you know, court cases lag years behind what people are doing online. And, you know, the fact that some content goes viral may make it newsworthy or or not, and it always depends on the context. So there are no black and white rules. Um, there was a recent case where 
uh, Eastern District of Virginia found that a concert photo was transformative because it was used in a political um, website blog and the court, not having listened to my copyright update, found that it was uh, transformative because the original purpose was to be expressive and show a rock concert and the other was to illustrate an article about the public debate on American Judeo-Christian beliefs. So this case, in my opinion, sort of crosses the line because you could have talked about Kid Rock without using this concert photo. Um, so the same photographer, Pilpot, um, who in fact puts his images up on a Creative Commons license with an attribution required, which is the basis of these lawsuits, uh, another court in a very similar type of use just came out on um, July 10th and said it was not fair use to use one of his photographs in an online article. And I think that was on uh, a, a, a Willie Nelson concert um, because there was no criticism or comment on the photo itself. So courts are definitely getting confused about when something needs comment or criticism or not. Um, and then there was a case just the last month in which um, a court found it in, again, this Eastern District of Virginia, that an image was transformative and fair use because it served an informational purpose where the initial purpose was um, promotional and expressive. So again, I think courts are confusing the fact that when you have a creative work, it could be licensed for many purposes. This case is has been appealed, and so we don't have the last word on this yet. Um, questions? Uh, Nancy, we do have one question from earlier in the section uh, from the audience. How do we know if a sculpture like the Bean or public park structures like St. Stephen's Park in Ireland are copyrighted works? Why would photos of such not be considered fair use or fair dealing? Uh, well, you can assume that if something has been created uh, within a period of, you know, copyright and, you know, the artist has not been dead for 50 to 70 years, that it is protected by copyright. So the bean would be correct, protected by copyright. Um, and then the only way an image of it would be fair use would be the context. So if someone was critiquing and writing about the bean in a way that uh, satisfied the factors, it would be fair use. But I think you would not want to say as a matter of law that every use could be considered fair use. Uh, it would have to fit under the factors and be considered transformative. Okay, one more. Um, a Virginia court just ruled that copying images from the internet and using them on a commercial site may be considered fair use. What do you think will happen and with this and should we change anything about how we operate now? Um, all right, so that is the Brammer versus Violet Hughes case that I posted. Uh, and you're right, the court said that because something was on the internet without a copyright notice that it was, quote, public. Um, I really think that this court uh, did not really understand the, the way you analyze uh, copyright and fair use and the factors and really had a poor understanding. I think what's happening, though, is that courts, I think, don't like seeing people get maybe trapped into a copyright claim because there may be a Creative Commons license and have the belief that something can be used. It may not have been in this case. Um, but courts are just, don't always get fair use right. Um, and I think this is a notice of appeal has been filed. So um, I believe on appeal that this will probably be reversed, but we shall see. Um, okay. So now, so if I can, it looks like we may be a little late. And so just for the participants, we'll continue. Uh, Nancy, you've got time to continue beyond two? I do. Yeah. Okay. Then we'll take a little. I have, I will try to speed up. And if we can't get to everything, we can't. But um, 
now that we've gone through the exceptions, it's like we're going to talk about, you know, what constitutes an infringement. And it's usually when one of the exclusive rights have been used without consent. And you have to show two things that the, if it isn't a duplicate and you can tell it's the same work, uh, for example, if someone has recreated a work, you would have to show that the second person had access to the first because there is a concept of independent creation and you have to show that protected elements of the original have been copied. Um, so you can have an infringement not by copying the whole, but just some of the elements. Um, an infringement can be the use of a work beyond the scope of a license. A license is a contract. And if you've gone outside the contract, then courts have found that that is a violation of copyright. So it's important to have cl clear contact languages to avoid infringement and keep track of those licenses. Uh, creating a derivative work, adapting content without permission can result in an infringement claim and asking another artist to recreate content that's similar can also result in a claim. Um, substantial similarity, there's different tests around the country, but usually the courts will compare with a visual work, the work side by side, and then they'll look at what elements are similar. And what they compare are sort of the elements that you see on the screen, posing, lighting, angle, background, perspective, shading, color, and viewpoint. And um, look and feel can also, for example, in New York, be something that the courts look at as well. Uh, what they try to pull apart is what is not protectable, what is commonplace, what they don't want to give a monopoly to one artist. Um, and a recent case that's come up that's really brought this into question is the Rentmeister versus Nike, where Rentmeister did an original jump shot and created the whole shot, even the idea of having the, the uh, sort of ballet legs spread out um, this was really licensed by Nike, the license expired, and Nike had another photographer recreate the shot, and admittedly they did, but their assertion was that what they recreated was original and did not copy protectable elements, that you could not protect the idea that someone was doing a jump shot with the legs spread out in arabesque, and that there were sufficient differences between the two works. This case has been going up in the courts in California. The Ninth Circuit just found that the works were not infringing and the court noticed all the differences between the angle of the leg and the arm and the background and the mood. And um, the photographer has just asked the Ninth Circuit not to finalize the decision and they're gonna ask the Supreme Court to look at this case. So you can see how difficult it is when you look at two works side by side to try to see like what's protected and what is not. Um, if you have a claim of copyright infringement, there are a number of defenses. Uh, sometimes a copyright registration may be invalid. There is the concept of independent creation where two people can come up with uh, the idea of creating something that's similar without looking at each other's work, uh, and you can't protect ideas. There's also the concept of de minimis copying where you copy too little, and sans affair, which is a term that means things that must be a way. And so if there's really only one way to depict a certain uh, pose or look, the courts are not gonna give a monopoly. And then fair use, which we've already spent a lot of time on, um, so the idea expression is sometimes you have to see it to know it. Uh, it and what, you know, there is an idea in every photograph. So where is that line between what's protected and what's not? A good example was photographing babies against a white background where the court said you can't even pose a baby. So the idea of having a baby against a white background is an idea. So the fact that there could be other photographs of babies against a white background uh, was not protected and could not be owned by one photographer and uh, Sansa Fair, which I mentioned. So uh, 
good example of that is that there are some sites that the same photographers will go to because they're iconic, whether they're landscapes or, or uh, iconic buildings that get photographed over and over. You're not going to just let one artist be the only one who create a work that depicts that subject. Um, there was a case in, uh, in New Orleans where two photographers took the same photograph from the same park. One admittedly had seen the other photographer's work first, but the court looked and saw that there were differences in mood and lighting and said that you cannot protect the idea um, and that both photographers express these ideas in a different way. Um, then the de minimis concept is, though there's been a technical infringement, it doesn't rise to the level of infringement and courts really struggle with how much is too much. Um, the, one of the original cases was Ringgold, which was this quilt that was used as set dressing in a television show. And the court looked at how many seconds it was there and it was available for, I think, 26 seconds. And it was something that was prominently displayed. So it was not considered fair use. And they said set dressing is used for the same purpose, which is aesthetic, uh, so it was not fair use. But then there's been uh, a very recent case of um, Rudowski who had a video on a YouTube channel and Mick Nick my network published an article featuring just one still image from the video. And the court did that qualitative uh, interpretation. And they said just taking one screenshot from the video was de minimis and too trivial to be an infringement. And the court drew a distinction from Ringel um, looking at the length of the time that the work was visible. And that was very similar in a video case, first in home box office and Gale. I don't know if anyone's walked around in New York, but you can see Art We Alone is something that an artist has been putting uh, on many parts of New York, a graffiti artist, Art We All. And it was very minimally and fleetingly displayed in this video. Uh, again, you probably can't walk through parts of New York without some kind of graffiti in the background, San Francisco, Philadelphia, others. And this is the idea that it was so fleeting and you'd have to freeze the flame, frame to even see it, that the court found it was de minimis and not an infringement. Um, and now we're getting to the newest sticky question, which is, is inline linking and embedding an infringement or not? There's a recent case, Goldman versus Breitbart, in which the a photographer got a, a photograph where, um, and he shared it with his Snapchat friends. Someone grabbed that and put it on another social media account. And then the news media picked up the photograph uh, and it was a news story that spread all over. And because it was embedded right from the, from the social media site, there was no license. And the defense was, well, uh, following Perfect 10 in California, there's no copying, so there's no infringement. And the court in New York said, well, uh, and I'll, I'll go into the Perfect 10 case dealt with image search and there were thumbnail images as well as large format images. The thumbnail images the court found were fair use because they served a function of directing you to the website where you could find the images. Um, but the larger images, which were just inline linked, were never hosted on, a, in this case, Google server. And the court said because there was no copy of the image, there could be no violation of a display right. And so that has been the rule of the Ninth Circuit where you, if you don't have a copy on your server, you cannot have an infringement. Well, the court in New York said, you know, not so fast that there may be a difference between what Google did in a search and what someone's doing by embedding a photograph in uh, an article instead where it looks like it's directly placed there and you, and you don't go back to the source. You're not being directed anywhere. Um, and the definition to publicly display something includes 
the term, you can display it by any means of device or process. And the court said that it, it is possible that uh, a device or process is this enlightened linking. And he said, well, it doesn't mean that the case may not be uh, considered another exception, such as de minimis or fair use or something like that. But just on the issue of whether embedding is infringing or not, the court found that it wasn't per se non-infringing because of the server. And there's been a few courts. That is on appeal. So that is the 21st century issue to look at embedding. Um, so very quickly, um, for those of you who have to leave, we will complete this webinar and it will be made available. You'll get a notice uh, from DMLA. Um, Nancy, we have a couple of questions sure. that came after the fair use section and then a couple more. Um, can you please give a scenario in which a police or government handout would be considered fair use and one where it would not be considered fair use? Okay, so when you say government, the uh, Copyright Act specifically, against, specifically exempts works of the federal government from copyright protection. So you could have state governments or local governments, which there is no exemption for. Um, though in the federal government, um, if they have employees that produce a brochure or information, that is probably uh, not protected. But if the brochure license a work, uh, for example, from a image library, that work may just be under license. Or um, the government might commission a sculpture and the artist may retain copyright, uh, which is true of some of the sculptures that are in DC. Um, so I think the FDR one, the artists do retain copyright. It isn't always easy to know, and, and that's a good question. Um, next question, are images admitted into court evidence of, uh, are, sorry, are images admitted into court evidence fair use? I'm not sure there's a court decision on that, but I believe that you can make a good fair use argument because they're being used for a different purpose. They're being used as evidence of something and not for their expressive value. Um, and of course, many images are introduced as evidence. Okay, next question. And they're not being published generally either if they're being introduced as evidence they're just being shown to the judge or to the jury okay sorry about that um using would using a government official portrait such as the one of ruth bader ginsburg be infringement i'm assuming not if the portrait is noted as being in the public domain right if if the photograph was taken by someone who's employed by the government and it's the public picture that's distributed to the press for publication, I would assume that that would not be an infringement. Um, but you need to understand the source of the, the photograph. And there's probably other photographs of Ruth Bader Ginsburg that are taken by independent contractors. So you'd have to make sure you had the government sanctioned one. Okay, next question. If you're restoring an old photograph, a professional portrait, scanning it for archival copy, seems to be okay under fair use. What if it's an orphan work and nothing is known about how to get permission? What are your options for using it in a family archival collection? Well, orphan works means that you don't know the copyright uh, owner or you can't locate them. Um, there was potential le legislation that would make it less risky to use it. So in this situation, it would be a technical infringement if it was still protected by copyright. Many old pictures could have been published without the notice, particularly old handouts, so they may not be protected by copyright. And so it's a risk analysis. If you're scanning it for a family archive and it may have been a headshot taken in the 50s of your grandmother, the risk is probably very low uh, because the copyright origin is unknown, uh, but you know, technically all of that could be infringements, which is why a lot of copyright copy shops are, you know, like to have uh, 
knowledge about or have a statement that you're, they're not going to be infringing copyright if they're making copies for you. I know that's been a, a problem with, you know, weddings and funerals and things like that when people want older photographs taken, which was part of the drive behind having orphan works law, which never ended up being passed. Okay, next question. Um, example, a professional photo where the photographer is not known or unreachable. Uh, want to scan photo for archival purposes. Is it copyright infringement to create a printed album using the scanned images to show a person's life story? Would that be considered biographical content? I think that's a follow-up actually. Uh, yeah, no. that's a follow-up. That's kind of, Again, that's context and I think I answered it sort of in the last one. You have to take a risk. Um, often documentary filmmakers choose to take risks when they're given family albums. Um, and the risk is probably low. So it, it's just a risk analysis. Okay, and uh, one in terms of infringement, is embedding a watermarked image considered infringement? If someone comes to a stock site and grabs a watermarked image and then posts or uses it, for example, in social media? It could be. Um, there are embedding, li embedding licenses where, for example, Getty Images has a specific license that allows you to do that. But if you just grab and drop an image and post it in social media, you have not gotten permission. So it would have to fall into one of the fair use factors. Um, so for example, the thumbnails in the Google image search case were transformative because they brought you right back and they helped you locate uh, websites and, and things you were looking for. And that's why it was transformative. So I don't, you know, it may or may not be, but it might be unlikely that just posting something because you like it in social media would necessarily be a fair use. Okay, and one more. Um, I, assur I assume you heard about the tech guy who, uh, to show that blockchain has its problems, registered himself as the owner of the Mona Lisa. Uh, is this infringement and is there any way an artist or a photographer can take action against uh, anyone claiming their work? Okay, well, because the Mona Lisa is in the public domain, it's probably not a copyright infringement, but I think no one would ever believe that. Uh, and, and if you tried to file for registration, it would be completely unforceable. My next section has uh, talks about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act where there are um, specific remedies if someone alters or modifies copyright management information. And that's possibly if someone uh, removes your credit and puts their own on, there could be a claim in addition to copyright infringement, a claim for violating section 1202 of the Copyright Act. So maybe we should move on to that section. Okay, and just to let everyone know, this is the last section. Um, so we, again, we'll go to the end and you can get a copy if you have to drop off. Okay, go ahead. Um, so the last part of copyright update or what happens, what are your remedies if a work has been infringed? So if one of the exclusive rights have been infringed, you have very specific remedies. There's an injunction, you can get impoundment, you could get damages and profits, you can elect statutory damages if applicable, and and if applicable, costs and attorney's fees can be uh, authorized with the discretion of the court. There's also a section on criminal penalties, which I won't get into here, but that has been added to the Copyright Act as well. Um, statutory damages is what everyone talks about as much. And to note that that is discretionary with the court. The range is 750 to 30,000 for one work. Uh, and a work is generally looked at a work under one registration, unless it's a, uh, a group registration of photographs. The courts can also reduce it to $200 if it's innocent or could increase it to 150 if willful, but they're not available unless you have a registration before the infringement or registration is in three months of first publication. And when you're looking at damages now, particularly in, um, when images are used on blogs and things like that, the courts are looking at a multiplier of the market value license free in many cases. Uh, so it isn't 
that if you have an infringement, a court is always going to automatically award $150,000, though every lawyer will always ask for that in the beginning. Um, but the courts do put some context around a use when, because statutory damages are in, in the court's discretion. Um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was passed in 1998 and it involved implementing two WIPO treaties. Uh, and this was really in reaction to the fact that the uh, digital distribution of content was so prevalent that in addition to just enforcing rights in, ex in the exclusive rights you're granted, there, they thought there needed to be liability if you tried to digitally protect your work and someone interfered with that and also that those hosting websites did not want to be liable for copyright when they had no control over what was being hosted on a website. So these are two of the significant additions to the Copyright Act, which are called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, I'll start with Section 1202, which deals with copyright management information, which is very broad, it include watermarks and metadata, um, but the important thing is that it, it doesn't mean that just because copyright management information is removed, you automatically will get these damages of 2,500 to 25,000. It really has to be done with the intent to induce, facilitate, or conceal the removal. Um, and so it, it's not something that if a software program accidentally removed all metadata, you would necessarily be liable. Um, you do have to meet all the requirements of section 1202. But in the situation where you talked about if someone purposely put, removed your name and put their name on a work and was distributing it, you could have a claim under this section of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, the other very significant section is the safe harbor for ISPs, internet service providers, also very broadly defined. And uh, the requirement they wanted, they wanted a no monetary liability for content of users stored on its systems if the infringing content was removed from the website expeditiously. Um, the ISP has to receive a very proper notice and you can always still proceed against a direct website infringement. Now this section has a lot of um, criticism over the years because it doesn't mean that once something's taken down, it will stay down. And so content owners are really frustrated that it's become what they call the game of whack-a-mole and would really like to see this part of the Copyright Act change. Of course, ISPs don't. Um, but to do a proper letter, you have to have all the elements that are in Section 512 of the Copyright Act and you have to properly identify the work linked to the alleged infringement. You have to provide contact information and you need a statement in good faith that the use is not authorized and you're authorized to act on behalf of the owner and it needs your signature. And the Copyright Office has a list of ISPs registered agents and you have to send the notice to the registered agent of that ISP. Um, and you would register um, with the Copyright Office. Now, if you want to register your copyright, that's also done with the U.S. Copyright Office, and that's all electronic now. And we don't have a lot of time to go into that, but there's an entire tutorial at the Copyright Office, and you have to have a deposit of your work, which is digital. You do not want to use regular mail. And they may not even accept it. Fees are going up. Um, so right now, because they're discouraging paper, it's $85, where it's only $35 per single image and 55 per online group. Um, and there's additional fees if you need something expedited, but these fees are going to go up shortly. So please, you know, always check the Copyright Office site before you make any assumptions. Um, and there's different registration options for photographers. These may be expanded going forward to other works of visual arts, but right now there's an option of filing um, a group registration of published works, though the Copyright Office is just limiting it to 750 now. Um, anyone can register large groups of unpublished works, though there will be new rules on publishing registration of, oh, I meant unpublished, I have a typo there, which is limited to 750. That should be unpublished, I will fix that. 
And there are many benefits of registration. You have a public record of the copyright claim. If you are a US author, you can't even go to court without it. It's the keys to the courthouse. Um, if you register before the infringement occurs or within that three month window, you can seek statutory damages and attorney's fees. Uh, and if you don't, your remedies are often very limited and, um, and in many instances, the, your damages just aren't worth bringing an action um, because you can't recover attorney's fees and you, and you can only recover potentially a license fee or something nominal. Um, because of that, there's some potential changes that would create a copyright small claims office within the copyright office where you could bring a streamlined action for claims of lesser value within the copyright office and it would all be done on paper and remotely. Uh, so there's a bill currently in the House of Representatives Judiciary Committee it has many sponsors. It hasn't gone to what's called markup yet. And we don't know if that's gonna happen this summer or even next year because the Judiciary Committee has a lot of issues in front of it, including, I guess at this point, having to pick another Supreme Court judge. But um, there's a, a lot of support for this uh, just to make the copyright system work for the individual creators and that really concludes my brief overview of copyright um, in a nutshell. Okay, so, great. We do have a couple more questions. Okay. Um, all right, so first, so a standalone image editing software application that honors or allows the user to enter copyright information and then provides options for exporting versions of the image where that CMI is removed without providing any warning to the user would not be copyright violation of DMCA since there's no intent to induce, facilitate, or conceal removal? Well, again, these questions are very specific, very fact specific. And if, um, for example, there's a lot of software that when you uh, upload images online, the engineers always like to have small files because it makes things load more quickly. That type of software can um, strip metadata. I know that that was brought to the attention, I believe, of, of years ago of, um, I believe, Photoshop. And there were some changes made to default settings because of that. Uh, but I, I can't answer without a lot more information, but yeah, you um, there, it does, you would need to establish that it was done with the intent to induce or facilitate an infringement. Next question, have any court decisions or opinions been issued on section 1202? Uh, yes, there's been many decisions and frankly, mostly recently, there was a long time without any. Um, and there was just a recent one in California, which did talk about that uh, the removal had to be with the intent to facilitate an infringement. The court decisions have not limited the section to just digital works. Uh, it also had to do, a, there was a case where I think a photograph was taken of another photograph and the name was cropped out uh, and a claim was brought under that. Um, but what happens is often there's lots of decision cases that get started and and uh, and the issue tries to be resolved before trial on a motion for summary judgment where you're telling the court, hey, that the law is so clear, you should be able to answer this before a trial. And if the court says, well, wait a minute, no, there are some factual issues, we want to go to trial because cases are so expensive to try you don't get a final decision because things settle. So there's been many cases brought with uh, this as an extra element in copyright actions, but you don't always get decisions. Uh, okay, next question. With the large amount of digital photos and videos being created, how do you recommend properly copywriting this content in order to get the best protection of the media? Well, the easiest way to copyright anything is to do a registration before you distribute work because then it is unpublished and it's much easier to register. So that would be the recommended way. And then um, 
you still, under the Copyright Act, have to separate published and unpublished work, which can be challenging because it is often unclear whether a work has been published or not, which is why it's easiest to always register before something's been distributed or published. And um, if you do want to take advantage of one of the group options, you can put together works that have been published in one year and register them. The recommendation often is to do it every three months um, to keep it more current. And also then you can fall under the three month window for statutory damages for works first published within three months. Here's a follow up to one of the earlier questions. You may have answered it. Are there any legal proceedings or cases which have occurred so far which have referenced a violation of 1202 of the DMCA in regards to the CMI in the form of embedded metadata being removed or stripped out? I believe there's a recent case in California. I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, um, but there has been also some cases, uh, like the early case of Kelly versus Arebasoft, where the uh, Arebasoft, which preceded other image search, um, co collected images and did not keep the credit that was underneath the image. And the court said that that was not an infringement of CMI because it wasn't sort of part of the image and they weren't, and so there was no uh, violation of CMI. Um, and I, I don't have a case on the tip of my tongue. I have to look into it, but I think there's been some recent cases that have looked at whether um, the stripping was with intent or not. And that, that's really the, the big issue right now is the intent. Okay, great. We have a, about two more minutes, so stick with us for the last two minutes. Uh, okay. Nancy, if you can progress the slides. There's, I don't think there's any more slides. Yep, click. Oh, there is. Oh. So first of all, thank you, Nancy, because your presentations are always so helpful. Um, post any additional questions for those of you on the call to the DMLA Facebook page, and we'll try to answer them in the next couple of days. Um, if you've got any suggestions for topics or would like to um, sponsor or anything you want to see in the webinar series, you can email me at the email listed here. Next slide. I cannot um, thank enough our sponsor CDAS for this webinar. Next slide. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't promote the uh, conference in Los Angeles. I think it's really going to be a great one, focused a bit on disruption and things that are happening in the industry. The lineup is looking really, really good. So registration is now open um, at the DMLA website, and we hope that everyone will attend. Next slide. I think that's it. All right, everyone, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Nancy, can't thank you enough. This. Uh, uh, recording will be made available via the DMLA website. We'll send out a notice when it's available. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. Sorry, it wasn't an hour. <laughs> it's good. All right. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.